Hello, everybody. Today we have a very special documentary, The Killer Clowns of Comedy. And apparently this one deep dives into stuff that I probably don't even know. You know, the rabbit hole on Joe Rogan and his Rogan sphere just keeps going deeper. And we're here to figure this shit out. So without any further ado, go subscribe to Chipped and Cloned for making this video so I didn't fucking have to. And uh, The Killer Clowns of Comedy, true crime show parody featuring joe rogan and more here we go due to the graphic nature of this program viewer discretion is advised could you imagine living your whole life and never killing they make their living by murder i think that people have forgotten what jokes are good art disturbs they're comedians bound by a code of silence don't tell anybody we also send people through the fucking roof Investigators try to catch these killers hiding in plain sight. That and more, next on American Crime. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. <coughs> guilty of murder in the first degree. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Of you and your brother Damn. shooting your parents. <sighs> it was the 90s, bro. This is real. Austin, Texas. Once a quiet college town, it's now a burgeoning city for young professionals and tech millionaires. This boom, however, has brought a new criminal element to this former sleepy burg. Drugs, violence, rampant homelessness. Most insidious of all, savage killers hiding in plain sight. Located on its historic 6th Street, in the heart of Austin's Arts District, lies the comedy Mothership, home to cold-blooded jesters with malicious intent. Dozens of these murdering... Dude, I cannot fucking stand that guy. Chris Stefano. Chris Stefano is up there for me with Mark Norman as one of the worst. Did you... The last podcast he came on, he basically had a panic attack and he the the way he talked about how he lives his life like i'm not just like such a child man he's just such a child how he made his family like move out of his house because he had anxiety like move out of the house that they bought and like remodeled and made a home he made him fucking move out on a whim and then i was like yeah i regret that later and it's like dude that guy dude that guy is Dude, all these people that Joe wrote, the, none of them are funny, man. Clowns take the stage every night, and every night the audiences are callously slain. Oh, yeah. Comedians Whitney, with Whitney Cummings? Oh, God. With an insatiable bloodlust lay waste to hundreds of people every night. The ringleader is this man, Joseph James Rogan Jr., a former sitcom actor and reality TV host. Joe Rogan is believed to be the head of an underworld organization based around the entertainment and eventual dismemberment of its victims. There's like a thing that happens in scenes where you have this top-down force. Oh, this yeah. one guy that's the gold standard. And then you have this army of assassins that's around this guy. Operating with the same playbook, Rogan and his cohorts gain their vast audiences through podcasting. An art form dedicated to the craft of interesting conversations, often falling short of their goal. Each show more vapid and mundane than the next. Rogan's show stands head and shoulders above them all. He's the North Star, the guiding light which they all follow. They pod Dude, I am sorry. Joe Rogan is not 5'8". He's like 5'4". And I'm only saying this just because we're just not letting you get away with it. You know why? Because short people do... I'm tall as fuck. And my whole life... My whole life, short men have done everything in their power for no no good reason at all that I was just tall and it offended their ego. You know, when I go to job interviews, you can always see it when you go to a job interview and, and it's a guy and he's he's a little he's a little lass and he looks at you and you know that look and you just, you just might as well walk the fuck back out the door. You know, it's just I don't know why tall people get such a bad rap. Look at airplanes the fuck's up with that well you, you i mean those those chairs and airplane were designed for people that are five seven and below i gotta if i don't fucking shell out some cash i gotta fucking put my knees in my lap for six hours straight you know what i mean it's just like 
I don't know why the world's so mad at tall people, man. It's not fair. Cars? Fuck, dog. Cars? Dude, you... what's wrong with y'all? Why are you so angry at me? Cast by day, broadcasting their subliminal messages to millions of people, making them feel as if they're friends, lulling them into a false sense of security, eventually tricking their easily manipulated admirers to see them perform. And then La Jolla Comedy Store, June 2nd through the 4th. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. May 26, 27, 28. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It is then, under the cloak of night, deep in the bowels of their clubs, when these savages strike. Mr. Rogan has the number one podcast in the entire world. A veteran of stand-up comedy with over 30 years experience, he regularly sells out arenas due to his popularity. Yet why does this man have extensive martial arts and weapons training? Wouldn't that be unnecessary for someone in his trade? Under close examination, the puzzle pieces start to fall into place. I look like a violent person. I'm just even the way I'm built. Like there's uh, most likely a lot of violence in my ancestry. For years, he's practiced hiding a killer rage with a smile. These days, he no longer finds it easy to. <clears throat> now, now I get it, you know, watching the first time and like, I, I don't want to be one of those people that watches a video, but the thing, and, and it's like, oh my God, like, but the thing for me, the more you see of Rogan throughout time, the more you just, I don't know, because he does do good things. He has helped a lot of people and promoted and made a lot of people famous, but it's either part of the trick to lure him to this like cult-like thing that he has going on, or it's just humanity. We both have light and dark sides, and sometimes those one of those plays out more than the other. But to me, Rogan just kind of seems like a bully. I don't know. Let's watch. To subdue his real instincts. I went crazy. <laughs> it brought me back to my fighting days. It was like the same, that person came out again. It was like, well, I didn't even know he was in there. Like, like an assassin, like a killer. Above the law and beyond reproach, these people act with impunity. Law enforcement has turned a blind eye to the deaths of locals and countless tourists. With ties to city and state government, Mr. Rogan is seemingly untouchable. Enticed by the promise of laughter, civilians are regularly brought to their death. But where did this all start? Los Angeles, California. Once the place of Ciro's nightclub, run by mobster Bugsy Siegel, the comedy store became home to a new kind of crime. And then there was one day, you were telling stories and you went on stage just and guns blazing and you murdered harder than I'd ever seen you kill before. I was like, this is crazy. It's like a different person. Rogan is seen here talking to Joey Coco Diaz. Yeah. You just fing kid. I, I don't know what it is. Like Joey Diaz, he's a great storyteller and hilarious, like not taking around that. But like I've just always gotten a weird feeling about the dude. And I don't know what it is. I just there's just something not right right there, you know. Um and I just don't know what it is. But the thing, the thing is, is like this whole, this whole Joe Rogan landscape is just getting, it's just not, it's not what it was. You know, y'all saw the Mr. Beast thing, right? And it's, and it's like that you have like this thing that just appears to be like changing the world for the better or whatever. Right. It just appears to be changing the world for the better. And then, um, then all of a sudden, it just breaks itself and here we are sorry i gotta change the change the thing on here my bad guys you know this is how it is when you do it on the fly okay we're good never mind and it just appears everything is fucking not what it is it it just comes out and just like blam, like surprise and then you're sitting here uh left confused and oftentimes um like how i'm feeling now is is the feeling people start to get before it all like kind of comes out i don't know that's why i say you know you gotta i don't know what this appearance thing just going forward man this appearance thing where we where we appear that we're really good people that we're better than others uh don't get it twisted like um <laughs> 
we're here talking about these guys. And for me, it's more of a mystery than a hating. Like I, I want to get to the bottom of like, where is this coming from? Like, what's the history? Like, especially I'm interested, like seeing this now I want to view the Carlos Mencia thing from a different angle. Cause all I've heard is their side and I've heard Carlos talk about it, but there's just, there just seems to be pieces missing. Um, not saying that Carlos didn't do what he did or whatever, but I'm saying it just, it just might not, it might not be what it, it appears to be. Uh, also, yeah, don't get it twisted. I ain't, I ain't some gold fucking standard neither. Uh, we mess up and stuff, but I think, I think that's where the problem with having appearances, it's like, it's okay to mess up. You can admit it. Like <laughs> everyone around you is messed up. And if they tell you they haven't, then like, you know what kind of person they are because we all mess up. It's just when, I guess when you go out there as an elitist and you try to be the standard and you try to control everything and you try to control the comedy scene, that's where, that's where people always get mad. Like you could do drugs, you know, you could do all kinds of things. You could be sloppy in public. You could say something fucked up on TV. But when you start to act and, and people will forgive you, you know, people will forgive you. Uh, but when you start to act better than people, that's, that's when, when people start to get really mad and just like, nah, fuck that dog. Them with jokes, they're fucking laying there like bodies. Diaz is a convicted felon with a violent temper known for telling tall tales about crimes he never committed a clever smokescreen used to conceal his real misdeeds. Coco Diaz is believed to be an enforcer for the Rogan Syndicate, a hitman tasked with carrying out bloody executions. Our timing's deadly. And at the store, your timing gets real. In the original oh, one? No. The last guy that mugged me up, it was a little Chinese guy. I'm on the corner watching him, he's watching me. I'm thinking, does he know Kung Fu? <laughs> <laughs> But I was so used to comics and degenerate pool hall people. You and I became friends Quickly. like that. Meeting in the mid-90s while working at the comedy store, both Rogan and Diaz apprenticed under Mitzi Shore. Nicknamed the godmother of comedy, Mitzi Shore spent decades nurturing the talents of young, impressionable comics, while in secret, molding them into cold-hearted merchants of death who danced on the ends of her puppet strings. But she had a whole system. That's why my mom had this natural instinct to develop comedians, because it was in her veins. I mean, we're all disciples. Yeah. We're all disciples of your mom. And when your mom told you you were funny, it was like the greatest gift. Yeah. That's another thing, is she never told me she loved me. I can't say I love you because then you wouldn't be a comic. Oh my God. <laughs> You're a science project. <laughs> in Mitzi's system, if murders are not carried out properly, the comics are ordered to kill the audience with explosives. Comedians call this process bombing and is viewed as an embarrassment. I would say I'm just baffled, I, man. I'm just baffled. You know, the last few videos is just stuff just keeps hitting me. It just keeps hitting me. And I just, I don't, I, 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 you know, I listened to a lot of Joe Rogan and you know, uh, I didn't, the whole manly man thing we've gone over this. Like I wasn't really falling for that, but like the bringing people on and like having great guests and sharing all this knowledge with people and, and him helping people get careers. Like I bought into it. Um, but it all, it doesn't, it doesn't seem organic now. You know, it just doesn't seem like that was Joe Rogan's organic uh, trajectory. It just seems like all of this has been uh, controlled. Like, all of it was planned out, you know? They, they just, like, they kept everybody in a nice gilded cage and never, never let them see the cage. Or maybe they, I'm sure they all knew the cage was there and they willingly went in. Oh man, it's just, it's too much. It's like a conspiracy, man. And, uh, I don't even like the word conspiracy, but it's wacky.
A bombing on stage is like sucking a thousand dicks in front of your mother. As a desperate final attempt when Mitzi's jokers have failed, they'll hurl bombs at their unsuspecting victims with the crowds brought to ghostly silence. Richard Pryor was like, you know, coming back to the comedy store when he was really sick before he died. I was the guy who went on after him oh, every wow. night, every night for like five weeks. Oh, geez. Every time he did a show, I bombed so many times going on after Richard Pryor. Oh, <laughs> it was death. This was not the only time Joe Rogan bombed an audience. The godmother would purposefully make him go on stage right after a crowd had been destroyed by expert comedians, not only to demoralize, but also as a patented method to train the killer instincts of her young recruits. I followed Martin Lawrence almost every time I worked on a night with Martin Lawrence. Mitzi really? always made me follow Martin Lawrence, and you would just sit there and watch him murder. I mean murder, falling out of chairs. Mm. I mean screaming in agony. I never bombed harder in my life. Comics face punishment for their failure, often subject to ritualistic sex acts against their will. I watched a lot of guys eat dick, yeah. Rogan was no exception. And then you would come out. I would eat dick. <laughs> just go up there and just eat plates of shit. It was during this time that he became known covertly as an expert on bombing. Whoa. Like it's blown out. Now, I'm obviously not a fucking bomb expert, but I talked to one. You should see your was... act. You know, that is pure evidence. They knew. We know. Mark Norman knew. Mark Norman. Look at that look old Joseph has given him. Like, bro, the, the, that's the one rule. Do you not remember the one rule when I let you in the club? Thou shall not tell the truth about my act. Thou shall not. <laughs> dude that's so gangster oh, i'm so happy like they know we, we you know that that's just they all know this stuff is shit tired of being under mitzi's thumb joe concocted a scheme a scheme that would make him the most powerful person at the comedy store what is that time life <laughs> presents the sounds of shab 60 songs on two CDs. The Spoken 90s. word over ambient music for ultimate relaxation. Featuring such classics as... Well, your navy hat would beg the differ. He just said beg the differ. Like haters, right? Incarus? Your parents had you when, when you are how old? Fun. Did you ever find Hitler? Yeah, so he died. Sure, just my fifth sure, show sure. in two days. It's the beast. I know, I know. Yeah. I used to think giraffe was giraffe. Oh, I thought it spelled wow. with a D. Yeah, dude. To order the sounds of Sharp, call the number on your screen or send check or money order for the amount shown, plus shipping and handling. Rush delivery available. Call now. After suffering countless humiliations at the hands of Mitzi Shore, AKA the Godmother, Rogan climbed the comedy store ranks by using a whole range of outrageous Machiavellian maneuvers. You remember what we were talking about yesterday? I'm just saying. You don't see me posing for no fucking picture like that. Just saying. I mean. He surpassed his rivals in his quest for comedy supremacy. Little did he know what it would cost him. No! By the early 2000s, illness had forced Mitzi Shore into semi-retirement. The once revered comedy store was now a ghost ship being run by handlers and hangers-on. Rogan, seizing on the opportunity, assembled a sinister crew of joke tellers with one intent, controlling the comedy store. They called themselves the Death Squad. Just Are you part of the Death Squad? Mm -hmm. Okay. But they, I have had problems with them. Because I was in cahoots with Mencia, they thought. However, his takeover was temporarily thwarted after Joe called out a rival killer, Carlos Menstelia, for stolen valor, sparking a nasty turf war. I'll walk into the comedy store, dude, after legends walk in there. Chris Rock was on stage. So I went on after Chris, and I just destroyed the room. That's where I got the nickname The Punisher. Of course I fucking steal jokes. When I come to a comedy club, you better run, bitch. The ensuing power struggle at the comedy store resulted in Joe's banishment. So I called Mitzi and gave her the whole rundown. And then she gave me a spot that night. And then they called me up two hours later to tell me that I was banned. So I said, wait a minute, if she's not running the store, who's deciding I'm banned? Down but not out, Rogan began plotting his way back to the top, biding his time, waiting for the perfect opportunity to present itself. It came in the form of podcasts. Always an early adopter, Joe rose fast in a sparse landscape with limited competition. 
Only after achieving vast popularity as a podcaster did Rogan return to the comedy store to reign without opposition. The new guys and girls that were coming up, they were fucking good, man. I was like, wow. I'd been gone for almost a decade. Quickly surpassing the influence of Mitzi Shore, Joe was nicknamed The Godfather. And at the comedy store, The Godfather was king. You know, Rogan, to me, he's the leader of the pack. Five, six years ago, seven years ago at the comedy store, it was the comedy rap pack. And we were the we were the rap pack. And we were the guys, and every show was sold out. Our name's on the marquee. And Rogan, there was a, you know, there's structure. Speaking here is Brenton Schwab, a failed protege of the Toe Father, whose career was crushed under the weight of his overinflated ego. Schwab, now lost without Joe as his surrogate father figure, recounts the highs and lows of being in the Rogan inner circle. It's just wild, man. You know, I didn't even... I guess I just live in my own world. Not that this is an important world. But it's crazy. It is actually pretty crazy that there's so much stuff that's calculated. I used to pull up... And Rogan pull up in his Porsche and we'd park next to each other and we'd talk shop about the cars and what's next. And then Santino would pull up and we'd talk to him and Chris D'Elia and then Brian would pull up and Bobby Lee and Theo and we'd be in there and it was the best. It was, it was the absolute best. Everything seemed to be right in the Rogan kingdom, but tensions were growing. In late 2020, Joe was forced to flee California for Texas after Governor Gavin Newsom assembled a task force focused on the apprehension of Rogan and his goons. Newsom is terrified that his son is listening to Joe Rogan. I really worry about these micro cults that my kids are in. And then immediately he's talking about Joe Rogan. And I'm like, here it is, the pathway. We're also investing hundreds of millions in new programs to tackle the root causes of crime. That is the California way. I was like, this ain't going in a good direction, and yeah. I fucking smell chaos. Word was out about the slaughters taking place under Rogan's command. What I saw in California was an erosion of freedom, and I saw it getting worse and worse, and I got the fuck out of there. And that's why I came to Texas. And the leader of the Rat Pack leaves, Joe Rogan leaves, and the comedy store shuts down. With the comedy store shuttered, Rogan vanished slipping out just as the noose was tightening. His cronies scattered like sticks in the wind. Then Tom Segura leaves. Then Joey Diaz leaves. Then Tim Dillon leaves. Then Theo Vaughn leaves. The most loyal followed to Texas, while those who had fallen out of favor remained in Los Angeles. And I'm on this island by myself. I'm like, whoa, where is everybody? Now that the comedy store was closed, Joe set his sights on a new goal. What did the man who has everything want? He wanted his own club. And when I came to Texas, one of the first things I did, I had dinner with the governor and I talked to him and his positions on these things are you got to let people run their businesses. You got to let people live their lives. The move marked the beginning of a new chapter, one that would see the power of Joe Rogan reach new heights. Power corrupts completely. It's just sad to watch. It's just sad that like things like I get the music's going and it's drawing you in, but certain things stand out with me. Like um, I had dinner with the governor. Who the fuck has dinner with the governor, right? It's just wild because I'm sure to the governor and to the state and to that, like, as you can see, Joe Rogan brings money. And if you bring money, you can have dinner with the governor, right? In May 2020, he landed an exclusive deal with Spotify worth more than $100 million, catapulting his show to the number one podcast in the world. Either under his spell or looking to ride his coattails, more than a dozen comedians went willingly to Austin. Fast forward though, now you live in Austin. Segura and Christina and me and Joe. We have Tim Dillon. Tim has more property in Austin than anybody. Tim's out here killing it. Ron White. It is the best situation for a comic to be in is to have access to Austin, Texas right now. Those New Yorkers that are real joke gunslingers, they come to Austin and they're looking at it. Ladies and gentlemen, Shane Gillis is moving to Austin, Texas. I don't know if I'm legally allowed to say it, but 
You can legally say Texas. Joe Rogan. All of a sudden, I'm in Texas, and all these other comedians come out here with me. So we just went and did it. To help run his secret society, Joe enlisted Adam Egott. He's the manager of the comedy store. You are part of the mothership. So I got all the best people from the store to come here. This is the dream team. Adam Egott, a man with his own secret and sordid past, fit right in. Your family doesn't know that when you were a young man, you used to jerk off punks for $15 a man? How insane is it to work with stand-up comics? It's fucking wild. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm insane. So yeah. Like, I have a huge void to fill, too. It's like I rode this wave perfect. Once he poached the top staff from the com Bro, I'm just bad. You know, I'm not saying as much as I usually do. Because seeing certain things now, it's a great presentation, right? We, we grew up on these kind of shows, you know? Um... This is this is classic 90s TV. But the things he's presenting, it's like connecting dots or I see a picture of something and I go, and that's why. And it just seems. It just seems like high school all over again. The cool kids said, fuck all the other kids and they took everything and, and they just, you know, and Joe Joe Rogan curated all of this. I mean, it's all th it's 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 all thought out comedy store the next step was constructing the perfect hideout monday on an all-new intervention is bird an alcoholic I'm curious what you think um, uh hold on as a liar if you're an alcoholic you'll get caught the best alone drinking you can ever do is alone behind someone's back yeah. and that's all i want to do for the rest of my life yeah is just make machine movies i'd love to see bert go sober and focus on other things what if he wants help there's help available there you go, I love it. I'm good. Intervention, Mondays at 10, 9 central, only on... Also, I'm just going to put it out there. Um, you know, when you're an addict and you get sober, uh, it's a great thing, right? But also, like, sober people can be fucking obnoxious. It's just like, a, they're just like vegans, right? Just like every, you know? And I get it, they're appreciative, but, you know the the in your face stuff all the time you know make you feel bad i'm not a fan of that just like oh tell, the first thing you tell people is you're sober it's just like why you know who cares good for you you know we're people you don't have to tell us that you know you once had a problem with a substance you know it's okay you're allowed to have problems you don't have to tell everybody a and e On the outside, the comedy mother shit is your average, everyday, run-of-the-mill, alien-themed comedy club. Inside tells a different story altogether. There's like these little, just tons of little things. Like here's like just a little alien. The alien theme is throughout the whole place. I feel like the stage itself with that kind of like half circle or half ring reminded me a lot of Stargate. There was this race of beings yeah. that looked just like us. They had a series of these devices called Stargates. What a Stargate does is open a stable wormhole. It's like a conduit from one planet to another. Still in secret, mind you. I mean, this is going on right now. The stage was constructed as a shrine to an interdimensional alien portal. The clues were hiding in plain sight. Great last, time at Mothership last, last night. That was a good time. Filled it and they will come. A magical portal. To fully unravel the mysteries hidden inside the comedy Mothership, look no further than one of modern history's darkest chapters. See, that's the theme of the Mothership Comedy Club. The thing is UFO theme. The rooms are called Fat Man and Little Boy. And in the UFO lore, the UFOs come right after the detonation of Fat Man and Little Boy. Mm -hmm. After the detonation of those bombs. In UFO folklore, that's like what happened. The connections don't end there. The building is alive. Yeah. That's what I like about the building. It's like the story. Was that mob hangout, that zeroes? There's like a swastika on the wall. So we tore the outside of the wall and you see the exposed brick. And one of the exposed brick was a fucking swastika. It's stated that the swastika is connected with extraterrestrial beings. You know what's really bizarre? Yeah. You 100% see those kind of things when you're tripping. And I do believe the Nazis were in touch with non-human intelligences. With the deep worship of extraterrestrials revealed, a trip to South America. It's like it's like he's uh he's got his own like weirdo rich person cult. You know how they always talk about the Grove? 
you know, like, look, like this is set up perfectly, right? He's like, they worship the alien gods, you know, they, they're all secretly like men. Um, and they're just like pretending, you know, and then they come out, they come out in their rituals and they just let them be themselves. You know, it, it just seems like, and they're just covering all kinds of stuff up their identity, who they really are all to, to make all this money, man. Damn, it sounds like every corporation, doesn't it? Shit, I guess this is what people do. This is no different than like Bill Gates or, you know, that they 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 curated their own little cult to make them rich as shit. Would reveal even more. A South American archaeologist contacted American Crime with a story about a strange group who stole an ancient artifact from a sacred temple. A member of this party matched Rogan's description almost exactly. Earlier this year, a group of white men came here looking for an artifact. They ransacked a sacred temple to retrieve it. Legend has it it would beam down a ray of light every full moon. One day, it descended from the heavens to pass down the word of God. It remained in the temple for over 100 years, until now. The thing you got, you know, like, this is a parody and, like, you know, things, but there, for me, it's it's baffling because there's, like, so much truth. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's the director's attention to use comedy to point you in the right direction um you never know a man now known locally as the white ape pulled out a bow and arrow and killed a group of men who tried to stop them from taking the artifact this artifact now resides in the lobby to the mother shit Let's do, let's do that. We need a UFO in the front lobby, a fucking actual flying saucer. Right, right, right. Like, Upon further analysis, the mother shit is not just a clubhouse for Rogan and his leeches, but ground zero for his alien obsessed cult. Because a lot of people think I'm already running a cult. <laughs> Even stranger are Rogan's ties to intelligence agencies. I'm Enough friends silence. with Mike Baker, who used, to, well, he's a spook. used to be in the CIA. Well, he's a real spook. It's a nice guy. Like, he's my handler. Mike Baker, his CIA handler, is a master of deflection. I've, I've, all, I, I don't listen to Mike Baker. I think Mike Baker is stupid to first off, just stupid. And I'm sorry, why the fuck would you have someone from the CIA on? Like, the CIA is the most gangster organization on this planet. And every government has one, and they're the most gangster organizations on this planet. They they literally are the government's HR. And you know what HR is, right? HR, human resources, is not your motherfucking friend. They'll be like, yeah, man, w w just tell us anything. We'll have your back. No, no. HR is the Gestapo for the company. They are the Gestapo. They take out anything that does not benefit the company and if you say something you're out you're done for that's it you know and that's that's what the cia is the cia is responsible for almost every single war america's in they uh are responsible for crack uh in the 80s and 90s they dealt that they work with the cartels like they do all of this stuff and it is absolutely wild why you would have the cia on your podcast knowing if if there was any moral stance you should like like these guys are not your friend these guys do things that are morally and i'm not saying uh morally based on it i'm saying like we could probably a hundred percent agree except for the people in the cia that that shit is fucked up they're behind ukraine they're behind it's just wild i just cannot believe like i want nothing to do with i like this is why i don't do they're scary you don't want nothing to do with them nothing and 
I, I, the reason this guy is on his podcast has always been like, no. And I remember listening to, I listened to a bunch of his episodes and it's just like a propaganda train. It's absolutely just trying to, and it always seems to happen in trouble, to, troubling times. So it's like he can almost stir the direction people should be going when they think about things. He wants, he wants, like, he comes on to be like, okay, this is how we should look at it. And no one, all of Joe Rogan, like, they sit through his dumb comedy. They're going to believe this shit too. Of course, the CIA would be involved in the biggest podcast on earth, man. This shit is wild, man. This shit is just too wild. Have you looked at any of the evidence of election manipulation? I've run out of time. Just like, I'm sorry, I gotta go watch one of the kids' games. Which, by the way, one of my kids, the middle boy, Sluggo, is uh, heading to Florida to go to boarding school. To boost the credibility. Never trust somebody that names their fucking kid Sluggo. What is that? Jesus. ...of the show. Mike Baker pulled strings to have whistleblower Edward Snowden appear on the podcast. I work hard on that. I try to mislead people. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Works to my advantage. You're doing a good job, man. Thank you. What viewers didn't know was that Snowden was calling in from Mike Baker's basement. Under Baker's tutelage, a mind control method was developed involving the use of psychedelic drugs. You know, what the CIA really dreamed of was sort of like a drug you could give to someone get them to commit all sorts of unspeakable acts, and they wake up the next day and they don't remember what they've done. A continuation of the MK Ultra program, dimethyltryptamine, or DMT for short, is the drug used on comedians to turn them into Manchurian candidates. Whatever you experience when you experience dimethyltryptamine, which we know is produced by the brain, you experience entities. Joe impregnated their mind with the poisonous philosophy that the world was sick, laughter, the only medicine, and not far down the line, mass murder. Comedy is, in a lot of ways, is kind of a group hypnosis. When someone's on stage and they're killing, I'm letting that person think for me. It's hypnosis in a way. You're hypnotizing people. Once under the influence of DMT, the worship of aliens is subliminally planted in the mind. Anybody who's smoked DMT will know that you do encounter entities. What I encountered doing DMT was so spectacularly alien yeah, that uh, that's the aliens. That the thing that it's always struck me about the abduction experience, it always happens at night. There are psychedelic chemicals that your brain makes. Is that where they're happening while they're lying in bed? Because your brain is just dumping psychedelics into you and you are having interaction with aliens every night. And, and then there they are. And it might be that there's a chemical gateway in your mind that when breached, you enter into a dimension. Then there's his obsession with not just primates, but werewolves as well. I was just thinking about that metal statue you have out there, the wolf fucking the gorilla. And I had this dream that I was like sneaking around, hoping they wouldn't notice me while, yeah. while werewolves was fucking a gorilla. His recent coming out as a furry raises even more questions. This is our first podcast coming out as our true selves. Rumors of wild sex. You know, all this guy do is highlighting, he, he's putting fancy music and nice things. And you know, he's his commentary is parody, right? On some parts. But all this guy is doing is he's pointing to the, the stuff that they say and that they do. It's not like this is parody. It's just so wild. You know, when you package it like this, man, like cult vibes are heavy. But also, why the fuck would you wear a furry outfit? I, I Unless you're a furry. You know what I mean? I mean, you got a ton of, you got a ton of money and you could just buy a furry outfit for one use. Got it. But to go on your show, oh, man... I don't know. I just don't, dude. I don't know what's true anymore. We're just, we're living, we're living in a. Why has life got to be so like crazy, man? Why has everybody got to do all this like sneaky shit? Like, why can't we all just hang out? And if we don't like each other, bam, the planet's big enough. Go, go to people you like.
I just don't understand why we always got to have all this control. It ruins life, man. This control, like, think about your job. Think about how much anxiety your job causes you. Like, especially if you got a bad boss, just just the pressure to perform every day is like, ooh. And then you throw in there, like, you have a, an employee or employee. Like, and that's just created so people can make money. And I just wonder, like, why didn't we pick a better way to exist on this earth? And then again, you know, also that's just me being selfish with my opinion, you know, and everybody else could think differently, but I just don't, I don't under understand why the ruling, you know, solution that came, came out in the end is to just dominate people in some form and make them your subjects, man, dude, life, man, life just, dude, it's just so hard. Sex parties have persisted for years. I know some bald fucking dudes are slanging dick out there. Look at Dana White, Rogan. Ooh, that was a slip up. Man, this is this is where it leads you. This is where it leads you, man. It is just why does money just corrupt you so much? Ugh. Man, it's just so hard for me. It's it's really like to be to be honest, you know, I come on here and you know, I do this thing and I uh you know, I play up the parts of me, you know, that are weird. Um because I I feel comfortable on here. I allow like my weirdness out and you know, I'm here, right? And it all seems, you know, oh, this is just a weird guy, you know. He's, he's just having a good time presenting this stuff. I don't know what the fuck y'all think, but you know, you're like, you know, that's what, but to be honest, man, like the deeper you go into the stuff and like, and just as you get older, life makes no sense at all. It's just like, I'm at this point in my life where I, I thought, I thought growing up, you know, I always like adopted this moral code. I come from a family just, it was, you know, it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good sitch. Um, but what got me through a lot of that is I always believed that when I could finally make my own decisions, right. And I could, you know, have control of the direction of my life. I always believed that if I did good by people, um, you know, I stayed out of people's shit and I contributed to the greater good of society that in the end, these things like wars, these things like uh, racism, these things that just divide people all over the planet would someday end. And, uh, you know, life like humans would all be able to live like in equality. And, and as far as equality, I mean, like everybody has a, a shelter. Everybody has food. Everybody is functioning well. Everybody can have health care. You know, like I didn't, I never mind about paying for things, you know, that helped other people out. I didn't mind with shit. We pay for shit that fuck that goes into politicians pockets. Why not help people out with our money? Right. It goes to the endless construction projects, uh, you know, and so I always thought that and then you get older and then like, like I was talking about yesterday and then the water company cuts off your water cause you can't pay. And, and it's, it's the middle of winter and you're taking cold fucking showers every night, you know, or, or, you know, the only heating in your house is a wood burning stove and you can't afford wood and you done chopped that na- chopped up everything outside. And now you're bundled in a blanket. You know what I mean? It's just. And then you see your friends that don't have health care die. Or you see your friends go to war and they don't come back. And you just see corporation after corporation abuse our society, abuse its employees, abuse the legal system, abuse the tax system, financially corrupt, putting out chemicals that kill people knowing that they will have to pay like a hundred million, but they'll make 2 billion. So ah. 
And so you get to a point like where I'm at now. And it says, if we're not moving towards the good of greater people, I get it. Stay in your circle. The, the best advice you'll ever hear is do what you love. Stay in your circle. That's all you can really affect. That is what you'll come down to. You, you'll, you'll come down to that point just because you have to. Because if you look at the world, the fuck is the point of living? And don't tell me religion. We don't, you, we don't want to go there. But that's man-made. That's what I'm going to say about that. That's man-made as well. And if you don't think power and corruption is in that shit, then I guess, I don't know. You know, it's your choice. Whatever you want to believe. But the point is, is everybody is after themselves. And we're not moving to a collective good. We may not be in the medieval age where we cut people's heads off for any little thing and stick them on pikes, but we don't have no problem sending a drone to your house and lighting that motherfucker up. So I don't know, man, like what, what is the purpose of life? If for humans, and I'm saying humans, it's different for the animals and the sharks or whatever, but for humans is not moving us in a more positive direction for everybody. Why is it that we always take the money even though other people suffer? I, I just don't know. I just always believed that it wasn't worth hurting people for money or it wasn't worth suffer like... Oh, I take all this money, but th all the workers here have to work below minimum wage and are on food stamps and they could barely pay their bills or they might be way behind. I never thought that was worth it. You know, how, how can you be somebody and not lift your, your fellow man up. And I'm not talking about there's people you're going to hate, have disagreements. But like I said, go your own way. But if you're working with somebody or someone's your friend, or how can you live this life of luxury while your friends, your neighbors, your community suffers? I just never understood that. And I'm not saying I'm some great fucking person. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. But because... I had some bad experiences growing up. I just never wanted somebody to live with that pain. I didn't want somebody to live with that fear. Or just like feeling, feeling like you ain't shit. I don't know. I can't get this fucking yeah, car Yeah, it happened to me in the five seconds I had it on, too. Sexual degeneracy permeates the fabric of this secret society. Oh, I would never suck your nuts. I don't ask. You do get up in there. I'm glad to have a best friend like that. I know, man. Hey, cutie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bro, it's so suspicious. I just like, you know, this guy, this guy ain't fucking... This guy's smart, man. He done unraveled the whole Rogan sphere. And it ain't even done yet. Strangely, Mr. Rogan had sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein's personal chef on his show, never to bring up the connection once during the softball interview. And I, that's what I like to do. I mean, you know, more age doesn't necessarily mean better. Jimmy Kimmel's best friend? Dude. It's just all, is it Jimmy Kimmel's best friend? And that's what I'm wondering. If it is, it's just like, man, what, it's so crazy. It's just different. Their secret society now extends beyond the comedy world. This cult has a hierarchy filled with scientists, Navy SEALs, and even celebrities. How fun was it to work out with The Rock? It's crazy. <laughs> You've been you bragging mean? about it nonstop. It's your new best friend, Brad Pitt. I become friends with Matthew McConaughey. I had dinner with his family. Roger Waters is my homie. And then we all hung out. It's one of the weirdest of my homies, like my famous homies. Jared Leto's not a fucking government agent. I heard this one rumor that you live in like an, an old military complex. But is it, it true? It is true. I had dinner with him and drinks. He's a fucking great guy. 
It is at these dinners where Joe holds court, his hierarchy on full display, flaunting his power. I've been in rooms with Joe, with some formidable people. He's the most powerful media person who's ever lived. He didn't get to where he was by accident. Andrew Schultz, a lieutenant in the death squad, the man who replaced Brendan Schaub, a man so vain, he always sits in a manner that will show off his expensive watch and sneakers. An avid social climber, Schultz has been a part of many secret and lavish dinner meetings. And we what sat happened? down at a great steak restaurant. We all went out to dinner and we go with Bob Lazar. You're talking about proof of another planet, another intelligence. And Bob Lazar is detailing to us shit that he couldn't even talk about on the podcast. Wild. <laughs> I'm sorry, the migraine is really making it hard for me to think. Many believe this is where Joe plans his hits and quells dissension in his ranks. Oh, why aren't you playing the mothership, Brennan? I don't deserve to be there. Me and Rogan have had this conversation. We were out of dinner about a month ago, and uh, it's just pet peeve not to bring it up. You and I together, I need a platform, and you need to let me come on the show. And Rogan's like, stop, not stop, you're not coming on my show. And Alex's like, I know, I think it'll be good. He's like, stop, stop, quit fucking asking me. Rogan was a savage on him. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want his house burnt to the ground. I want to go to the middle of the night. I want to burn you oh, fucking people have the weirdest things you focus on. <laughs> <laughs> Just, what do you mean, you people? What you. Do you mean? Their sycophantic laughter revealed some harsh truths. <laughs> Every comedian reveals their secrets openly, never to receive any consequences. Stavros, Greek, last name, Bert Kreischer. Two comedians of great girth, better known for how they laugh rather than for the jokes they tell. It's never not funny. <laughs> <laughs> A prime example of how comedians openly discuss their deadly agenda, free of consequences. I go, yeah, but we also send people through the fucking roof. We never think about the flip side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny, a comic's brain is so different than a, than a pedestrian's brain. Kreischer, a loose-lipped Russian intelligence operative, can't help but expose secrets when trying to please others. I mean, that's like the Joe I knew, and then $375 million later. Kreischer let slip the extent of Joe's Spotify fortune, and thus, how he maintains power and influence. You know, when you're seeing these guys like Brian Simpson going up and murdering, Shane Gillis is going up and murdering, Tony Hinchcliffe is going up and murdering, there's like a feeling in the building. This culture of comedy it makes me feel like we're of the same tribe. With the mother shit open, it was now time to start training the next generation of assassins. Hey, Kill Tony fans, it's finally here. Hell yeah. It's the all-new talking Tony Hinchcliffe doll. We've become an arena act. Each doll comes with seven key phrases. What's the gay part of town? Just pull the string and watch what he'll say next. I didn't know that Mythbusters had Down syndrome. This is one doll you don't want to hide in the closet. <laughs> the all-new talking Tony Hinchcliffe doll from Comedy Brain Toys. I love it. Buy yours today. The comedy community grows in size and influence every day. It was only a matter of time before the ugliness of this seedy underworld spilled over into civilian life. 48-year-old Sheldon Johnson charged with murdering a man and then dismembering his body. That's Johnson appearing on the popular Joe Rogan podcast. Now a group of detractors have emerged to strike back at these egomaniacal stool humpers. Jada, I love you. G.I. Jane 2, can't wait to see it. <laughs> oh, wow. It was a G.I. Jane jump. I was sickened. This is a really clear indication that uh, we're not the cool club anymore. Comedian Dave Chappelle attacked on stage while performing at the Hollywood Bowl. Make some noise for hip hop history. A local man accused of attacking Dave Chappelle on stage says he didn't like Chappelle's jokes. While those who have risen up against comedians have paid with their reputations, those who have tried to help them personally have paid with their lives. 
prominent Hollywood therapist Amy Harwick was found fatally injured beneath her bedroom balcony. A former boyfriend has been charged with her death. We the jury the above entitled action finding defendant, Gareth Kristoff, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. Famed Hollywood sex therapist Amy Harwick, the latest victim of this deadly subculture. Comedian Drew Carey, her former fiance, speaks on her giving nature. She cared so much about helping people. That's uh, that was her life's purpose. Gareth Pursehouse, the ex. I was talking. I you know if you didn't know the Drew Carey show, um, released. I think it's on like Freebie or Tubi or it released. Like you can watch the whole like hundred and something or two. I don't know how many episodes, but it released. And I was talking about it uh with my girlfriend and we were just like yeah you know like how many times have you seen like every episode like that was always on growing up um on repeat too for your you know but i also thought about like drew carey just dipped out he just did the drew carey show which was awesome um, and then he went, he did that for a long time. And then he went right into the Price is right. He ain't, you don't ever see him in any scan. Like you don't ever see him in like the limelight or like, you know, and it's just like, maybe he knew all along, you know, but then who knows what his world is like. Friend responsible for her murder was a contestant on the podcast. Kill Tony. I was talking to an ex uh -huh. and she told me that when we first met, she thought my personality meant I had a small dick. And I just want to make it perfectly clear right now that my dick size is private. Some say that Kill Tony is the center of the comedy universe. And Kill Tony is the cornerstone of the stand-up community. Mm -hmm. Because Kill Tony is this wild YouTube show. HEB Center sold out arenas that we're doing, no big deal. They pull your name out of a bucket and you have one minute to perform in front of a live audience. And here at the number one live podcast in the world. And it's like a roast. Table, yes. right? Okay. Oh, yeah. You know, Tony and the guests will just destroy that person. Edward Scissorhands over here if he's a, <laughs> after being made a real man again. And Tony's like the best roaster alive. While others say it is a low-level American Idol ripoff. A trial by fire for amateur comedians, its true purpose, to make its host, Tony Hinchcliffe, look good by comparison. Stepping on <laughs> unbelievably fast, witty fucking jokes that I can't do now because the opportunity has passed. <laughs> Incredible episode for Redman. He will literally do anything to crush any momentum or <laughs> setup, and then you hit the, okay, you dick. suck, Redman. Take the beating that you deserve. I'm like a power lifter that gets to go to the gym. You know, if he doesn't go to the gym, he's probably out there breaking windows and throwing shit and, you know, road rage. Not everyone is charmed by the facade. Yeah. Holy fuck, this is fucking brutal. Is this gonna be an hour of this? Who are you? Well, I, I'm, I will never sign up to make fun of people that donate their time. Criminals don't just perform at the club, they also work there. Shout out to Joe Rogan. I don't know where the fuck he at, but listen, we hear that. With Kill Tony serving as the training ground where petty criminals are turned into professional killers. David Jolly, you're on the side. This is the Orlando man. Investigators say posed as a legitimate real estate agent. According to court documents, Jolly swindled at least 13 people out of nearly $90,000 by pretending he was selling their timeshares. He's also on probation right now for the exact same charge. Tony Hinchcliffe, that's my real home, boy. Stupid ass, boy. For this reason, security at the comedy mothership is tight. And where my club is on 6th Street, that's a wild place. There's a lot of crime there. We hire off-duty cops uh, to work the club. And we want to make it as safe as possible. Upon admittance, patrons must surrender their cellular devices, have their faces photographed, and adhere to a strict code of silence. Welcome to Cosmic Mothership. A couple things before we get started. No heckling the show, no recording the show out of any way. Bathrooms in the lobby. Uh, you can check your phone in the lobby too. You know, your phones are locked up. They make you lock your phone in what's called a yonder bag. You put your phone in it, it's pretty much impossible to open. When you come in, they actually take a photo of you, like a passport photo. I gotta take a picture and lock up my phone. They now know exactly who you are uh, by your face and everything. I mean, this is Tony Hinchcliffe, the killer. Joe Rogan, these are murderers. Everybody has yonder back. It's crazy. Remember I was saying about the CIA? 
If somebody's involved with the CIA, get the fuck out the way. Right? Does not do, bro. You guy ain't gonna fuck with you though. No. Mm mm. Mm mm. Because if you you in some crazy shit, my life is too short to be in some crazy shit. I ain't fucking with you. You know that just ain't happen. That's crazy, dog. The CIA. That's crazy. Bags so the, the phones will be locked up so you can get crazy. <laughs> they, they do at your club. <laughs> yes. Tell us something interesting about you. Cause you seem like a very very normal white guy from San Diego yeah. trying to come into a place that's filled with monsters. So. Why has no one caught them? Why have these crimes gone unpunished, unnoticed by the public at large? Until now, there was virtual silence in regards to these atrocities. Recently, American crime was contacted by a survivor of one of these horrific attacks. For their safety, they've asked for anonymity. I was invited to the club. I just wanted to laugh at some jokes. I wasn't prepared for what followed. Our witness was once a part of Rogan's inner circle, even though he's not a comedian. After being forced to flee for his life, he believes witnessing the mass killing was an initiation ritual. Joe had taken us all out for dinner. He was gracious enough to take us to the club afterwards. Everything seemed to be going fine. Then things took a turn for the worst. Our witness also submitted to us this recording, produced as they were fleeing for their life. We warn our viewers this recording is graphic and not for the faint of heart. One of the best comedians on planet Earth, the one and only Joe Rogan. But wait, but wait, please take a seat. I had a pot gummy bear the other day. I think we can all agree a gummy bear shouldn't be able to steal your soul. Right? What the fuck are these people making these things, man? We used to be monkeys and we found mushrooms and now we're different. If we don't know what we're doing, if this country was a person, we'd be on coke, driving a yellow Corvette. Dollar, dollar bills, y'all! What are we doing here, man? There's certain noises we can't make with our face anymore. Despite their emotionless, robotic nature, our witness wept through most of the interview. Haunted by the memory of the massacre, he now questions his long-held personal beliefs. How has this experience affected you? I used to think love was the only answer. Love could end wars, like the one in Ukraine, for instance. After witnessing the carnage on that fateful night, I no longer know what to think. The senseless deaths of those in the crowd that night have confirmed the worst. These ruthless killers will not stop. Uh, dog, let me put this, I'm not gonna hunt you down. But if I ever bump into you, I will run you over with a fucking car. It drives me insane, I can't beat the fuck out of these people. I'm waiting to fight somebody at a venue, I can't fucking wait. I'm like, I'm definitely going to jail if anybody sees my joke notebook. I'm just so glad to be a part of this society of misfits. Dying on stage, they call mm -hmm. it dying for a reason. I thought that was gonna get a bigger laugh. <gasps> bombing, it's yeah. called bombing. It's just nothing. So don't put it on me that you feel bad. Figure it the fuck out, okay? Don't make my life be a problem for your life. Empowered by unnatural worship and deep political connections, these life-stealing comedians show no signs of slowing down. It is estimated there are 250 of these killers on the planet. The police remain hopeful they can one day serve justice, finally bringing peace to the families of so many victims. On the next American Crime, furniture manufacturers are crippled by a growing trend. The industry is having trouble keeping up with demand. Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog. Damn, son, where'd you find this? There you go, guys. Go subscribe, Chipped and Clone, the killer clowns of the true comedy show parrot. True crime show parody featuring Joe Rogan and more. You know, there's a lot of lot of embellishment on some things and a lot of, but they pointed, they pointed at some things that could reveal some truths. And it's just, it's baffling. You know, I, it doesn't fit so well together looking like a cult. If there isn't some kind of 
culty in there. And you look at all the guys that he has around. None of them are funny. He doesn't, he doesn't keep people around that are really, really funny. His inner circle is full of non-funny people. It's wild. But thank you for sticking by. This was a long one. Uh, also, like and subscribe and share my stuff if you like it. Thank you. Goodbye.